Hi, I'm Ryan Field, the product lead for the Kernel Flow device, and I'm here with Dr. David Boas, a professor at Boston University who has spent decades developing and working with FNIRS systems. Together, we are going to tear down the Kernel Flow device and point out some of the interesting features that enable our system. As we go through, Professor Boas will be able to ask questions as we dig deeper into the design. He has not previously seen any of the details of this device. So let's get started. David, thank you for joining us today to go through this teardown of our system and see what's inside of the, the Kernel Flow device. So I'm going to take you on a guided tour of the technology we've built to kind of show you uh, piece by piece uh, what we put together. Uh, and I want you to ask as many questions as you, you want, uh, kind of poke around. And uh, uh, as I do this, we can uh, you know, just have a, a back and forth exchange about the things that interest you. Uh, so I'll start off by showing you our full uh, kernel flow device. So I have it upside down so you can kind of get a feel for uh, all the, the modules and channels that come together to build this. So there are 52 individual modules here. Each module has a single laser uh, in the center and six detectors around the outside. So what that means is on an, a full head, we have 52 lasers and 312 detectors. Uh, and as you can see, we kind of uh, have the modules snap in to the helmet uh, very nicely. The other thing about the device, again, um, is we've kind of structured it so that there are groups of modules. So you can kind of see from the side here uh, that we have a cluster of seven that would cover part of the, the auditory cortex where your brain processes sounds. Uh, and then we have some group together in the front here uh, for the prefrontal cortex. Um, and then we have motor and uh, the visual cortex in the back. So, so we kind of tried to design the headgear both in a way that uh, sort of covers all the key areas and uh, is flexible enough so that people with different size heads could still use the same device. We don't need to custom build the headgear for each person. Um, and so that's the idea behind putting them on these plates. Is each module like a self contained or um, uh, or do they communicate between modules? So each module is self-contained and we have a couple of microcontrollers that are on the helmet to gather the data uh, and then ship it off uh, through a single USB cable. And actually uh, in just a minute, I'll show you a demonstration of a self-contained module plugged into one of the microcontrollers uh, and a single USB cable hooked up to the computer uh, with live data coming off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. I look forward to seeing that. <laughs> uh, any questions about the full helmet or should we move on to that exciting part of the demo? The, um, I, well, you know, so we're using this to measure hemoglobin concentrations. Um, you know, typical ethnier systems will have two wavelengths. Um, how about this system? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Uh, we do have two wavelengths. Uh, so that center source light pipe I showed you uh, actually has both a 690 wavelength and an 850 wavelength that come out of it, uh, out of the same source. Okay, great. And I'll show you how we do that inside the module when we take it all apart. Mm -hmm. All right. And this distance between the emitter and the receiver? Yeah, so on this, uh, within the module, it's a 10 millimeter. Uh, source detector spacing. Uh, so that's uh, the separation there. And then between modules, we can also measure the, the uh, light that propagates between one module to the next. And that's a um, about, uh, the first one is 10, the second one's about 22. So there are you know, two in a line that are 12 millimeters between the, the two adjacent detectors. Got it. Do you also get the third nearest? Uh, yeah, so we actually get uh, out to about 35 millimeters uh, pretty cleanly. Uh, and we're still doing some tests, so maybe we'll get 40. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's early days of having these systems together uh, and, and really starting to do measurements with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Very, very nice. Wow. All right. Um, you know, I have some detailed questions, but I, I can wait to bring them up later. Yeah, so let's dive into the details. I'm going to show you a demo first. Pause for one second. I'm going to move all my computer stuff into frame so you can see it. I've got a single module. Uh, it's connected to one of the microcontrollers that aggregates data, plugged into a single USB cable. So we're going to get both power and data over the USB cable. 
those microcontrollers are on the helmet or are they uh, in some backpack sort of thing? On the helmet. And a microcontroller can communicate with how many modules? Uh, that's a good question. So we have it uh, split up hierarchically. So we have uh, a, one microcontroller connects to uh, 14 to 16 modules. And then we have one master microcontroller that uh, pulls data in from all of the, um, all the modules. So you have like four microcontrollers then? Yeah, five, five total, yeah. So on the left is a histogram view. And what I'm showing are the histograms from all six channels of a single module. And then on the right here, you can see total counts first time. So I'm gonna try and do as a demo for you where you can see both the histograms uh, and a good pulse signal uh, from the total counts channel at the same time. So uh, I have it face down on the desk right now. If I compress it, uh, you can see that the noise goes down actually. So this is- uh, It's just a counter. There's no phantom, there's no scattering material. Right, right here is just a desk. I'm just uh, yeah, pressing it down. Um, so then if I uh, put it on my hand, you can see uh, histograms on the left side and the total counts start changing on the right side. And then what I'm gonna try and do is use both my hands and get a good heartbeat signal off of my forehead here. I'm, you know, I'm confident you're gonna get heartbeat with that signal to noise ratio I see with the TPSF. <laughs> Well, the, there it is. Yep, yep, I see it. And, the, and that's CW. That, that's total counts. That's total counts. That's CW equivalent. Yeah, um, total counts, what? Uh, sample rate. What is the update yeah. rate? So that, that's why I wanted you to see the heart rate. So we're updating at 200 hertz, uh, which uh, is which uh, pretty, pretty impressive. So for broader context, um, most time domain systems today uh, that are equivalent to this uh, usually collect at about one hertz. That's one sample per second. We're running 200 times faster than that, which lets us pick up a lot more of the... What were you just showing you know, on your forehead there, at, you know, about how many photons per second? Yeah, so this is, um, I, I took it off. This is about four million counts per histogram. So that's about... 800 million counts per second, almost a billion counts per second. That's pretty insane. <laughs> that is pretty insane. Yeah. We... I think that, I right. So typical time domain systems, you know, you'll worry about um, uh, the photon pileup, you know, when you get to 1 million, right, per second. Uh, so you're already at 800 million per second. So that, that uh, gives us some idea of, of you know, the impressive uh, engineering inside that detector. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we worked really hard because we knew that uh, one thing that uh, would really unlock the power of time domain system was being able to get the signal fast. Um, and by getting fast signals, um, we can do a, a lot with this. And so each of the six detectors gives that 800 million counts uh, per second. And then we have you know, 312 of those across the head. So we, we generate an enormous amount, or we capture an enormous amount of photons per second, um, yeah. which uh, just allows us to, to really resolve what's happening inside the brain even better. So, I mean, I, I have a detailed question about the IRF, if that's okay, or I could save it for later. Um, you could ask the detailed IRF question, and then I'll power this down, and we can start tearing apart what's inside the module, so you can can yeah, yeah. see the engineering that went into it. Yeah. So I, I so I know the measurement you're making now that you showed just now was a well only a one centimeter separation, um, mm -hmm. and but when the light was when the probe was looking at the desk, you know, you're measuring the reflectance off of the desk. And, you know, that is a little bit more narrow than what's on the head. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm so what is the width of that? So the, the width of the IRF, uh, so the, the IRF is the fundamental limit of uh, sort of the time resolution of the system. Uh, so full width half max is around 200 picoseconds. Nice, nice, um, nice. And we get about five orders of magnitude dynamic range when measuring the IRF. Yeah, I'm 
Impressive, right. Okay, so that, right, of course, that is a log scale. Maybe, can you put it back on your forehead? <laughs> sure. Uh, and I, I also, I, I, I want to reiterate that this is in room light conditions, so there's a lot of extra background. So how many orders of magnitude are we looking at there? So this is 10 to the fifth to 10 to the second, just on my forehead here. Got it, got it. So like, I see a couple channels there that were really tall yeah, and yeah. low noise, and then a couple other channels that didn't have as much dynamic range between the peak and the noise floor. Yeah, so the, um, this is actually something I did for, to make the, the visual easier. So I lowered the red laser power so that when we look at total counts, red and infrared would be uh, separated enough that we could just look at the infrared and see a clean heartbeat. So uh, the red is just as strong as the infrared. I just turned down the laser power for a better measure. Nice, OK, I forgot. Right, of course. There's six detectors, but each detector, you've got two wavelengths. Yes, yes, that's true. So the purple, the purple, yeah, the purple is infrared, and the blue is red, obviously. Uh, very intuitive. What is the, the laser pulse frequency? That's a good question. Um, we wrap at 20 megahertz. 20 megahertz. So. An average power? Uh, for safety concerns, right? Yeah. So for red, we're currently operating around 2 milliwatts, and for infrared, around 4 milliwatts average power. Nice. Perfectly safe, yeah. Yeah, um, it's safe uh, both eye and uh, skin exposure. So uh, it's really a harmless device in terms of uh, the, the risks of using something like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some people may worry about, oh, is it bad to shine lasers at my brain? Um, but if you think about it, uh, the, the laser light is going through the skin, uh, the sometimes hair, uh, and the skull before it gets to your brain. Uh, and we've designed our detectors to be so sensitive that we can pick up just a few photons. So the photons that actually make it to the brain, there are only a few, uh, and, and then we're picking up even fewer that come back out. So most of the light gets absorbed uh, in the skin and skull layers before it uh, gets onto the brain. Right. I mean, one way I like to describe it, you know, a milliwatt of this laser power is 10 to the 18 photons per second or a million, million, million photons per second. And if you detect even a thousand photons per second or a million photons per second, you're doing pretty well. Yeah. So you can withstand quite a bit of attenuation. Yeah, it's great. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of photons, but not much risk to the brain tissue, right? <laughs> I, I also, I like to compare it to walking outside on a sunny day. So, you know, the exposure your brain gets from a sunny day is not that diff. Oh, sorry, the other way around. The amount of exposure your brain gets from your light source is not much different than a sunny day. Should we move on to tearing this down? So uh, I've got a similar module that I just showed you. Uh, this one um, is being sacrificed for your enjoyment. So uh, you can see uh, same thing, the light pipes, everything, um, and it's tethered. So I'm going to start. I'm just going to take off. We have a, a heat sink on the back, which helps a little with the thermal dissipation to keep our lasers operating. What we have here is uh, heat sink. Can you see that okay? Yeah. 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 And then uh, the other side is the 8-pin connector and a couple of magnets. So that's how we uh, lock in uh, the, the modules into the, the overall headgear. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's our heat sink. Uh, it uh, helps with, like I said, keeping our laser happy. We want to keep our laser happy so we get good stable performance out of it. I mean, since uh, you brought it up, I mean, like if you put your hand there, what temperature will you feel? Uh, it feels uh, just a little warmer than body temperature. Um, so I was just holding it comfortably on my forehead. Uh, the forehead side, you feel nothing. Uh, the front, front housing is made of plastic, uh, so it's pretty, pretty good, thermal insulator. Uh, and then the back side is aluminum. So we've designed it so all the heat uh, goes toward the back, so that way uh, no one is like feeling the heat on their head. So what I'm doing is I'm taking off the front housing, uh, David. So uh, split the module into two parts. 
Um, I want to start by talking about what's inside the front housing so you can get a good feel for that and then we'll dig into the electronic side. Uh, so in the front housing, what we have are all of the, the optical elements. So uh, it's a relatively simple optical system. We have uh, seven light pipes in total. The detector light pipes uh, are around the periphery and they're each two millimeters in diameter. Uh, the center light pipe is where the sources are uh, and it's a three millimeter light pipe. Uh, when you press on them, there's a spring behind it that allows it to compress uh, to the head and this helps with conforming to the curvature of your head. Um, so we chose to use springs to do this, um, uh, to, to make it conformal rather than to, to try and make the electronics in the whole system uh, flexible and conformal. Uh, so it was an engineering choice to simplify things. And so to enable that, what we've done is... In so there's going to be a variable gap between the light pipe and the source or detector, right? So that would create some engineering challenges for you to make sure you had good coupling efficiency. That's a perfect segue to what I wanted to show you. Um, so we designed a simple collimating uh, imaging system here. So we have two lenses in, the, in front of each detector. And what we're doing is we're basically imaging the tip of the light pipe onto our uh, detectors. Uh, this allows us to uh, be able to tolerate the movement of the light pipes and maintain a similar intensity uh, at our detectors. So I'm unscrewing the back the plate. The springs must also be circumferential around the light pipes. Um, that would also be a slightly cha slight challenge, I suspect. Can you see here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is the bottom set of lenses, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. And yeah. then uh, these are all the springs that yeah. uh, are used to, to make the light pipes move. So I'll take out the center one first. Uh, the center one is the least interesting because it is a uh, straight rod. So there, there are no, no optics on this. Uh, it's just a glass rod. Uh, we yeah. cut it, polish it, uh, put a spring around it. Um, the interesting ones are the detector side, which if you can see here, is um, a small uh, imaging lens with a light pipe attached to it. So these are custom molded optics that we designed. Uh, they're plastic molded, so we can make them very inexpensively. Uh, and they sit on top of the spring so that when it's compressed, uh, it can move up and down. Very, very nice. And so then the other lens sits at the bottom of the spring, so we form that uh, two lens imaging system. Uh, and that's how, that's how we keep um, the uniform intensity at the detector, even with different head, head shapes and, and curvatures. Yeah. That's a really nice design. Thank you. Uh, and there are many academics making wearable systems right now who will be very jealous of that. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, um, I guess the other thing I should point out is we've designed the uh, tip of the light pipe uh, to have a, a numerical aperture similar to that of a fiber. So we're a 0.43 uh, NA. So we kind of, you know, a big advantage to going to this wearable system versus traditional systems is we get rid of all the fibers. The fibers are messy, they're difficult to work with, um, and they, um, you know, can limit your detection efficiency, really. Uh, and so we, we cut out all the fibers and replace it with just a small little light pipe uh, but we tried to maintain some of the optical properties of the fiber so that the, uh, the systems perform as well as uh, at capturing the light from the scalp and uh, bring it into our, our detection systems. Yeah, do you have any other questions about optics? Um, wow. You know, getting through the hair. You know, that... That is a, a, a big challenge um, for application of these helmets. So, um, you know, what, how did that impact your design decisions? Yeah, so um, actually there are a couple of things we've done to help work with that. So you can, I just took one of the other modules off the helmet that's still put together so you can see. Yeah. Um, so you can see there are two features. One is there's this little um, ring around each light pipe, pipe plateau. Um, and then the other is the compressible light pipe. So the light pipe uh, itself 
can act like a comb. So it's got a combing uh, uh, feature to it so that uh, it can move. If you sort of shuffle the, the helmet around on your head a little, it could move the hairs around. But the hairs still need somewhere to go. Uh, so that's why we left these uh, uh, troughs in the front of our, our housing so that the, the hair has somewhere to go when, when the light pipe uh, sort of wiggles its way in there and combs the hair out of the way. Uh, so um, we're, we're still in the process of tuning the length of these light pipes. Um, so we need to do a lot more user testing to try and make sure we can uh, accommodate all hair thicknesses and sizes and things. Uh, but this works pretty well on most people. Yeah. I want to get my hands on uh, some of those light pipes. <laughs> uh, in time, in time. So. Um, I'll move on and show a little bit of what's inside our, um, uh, the base part of our, our module. So this is where all the electronics are. Um, so what I'll show you first are the six detectors. Uh, these are custom built by Kernel. Uh, we designed everything on the chip uh, to, to do all the functions that we talked about before. High photon count rate, high sampling rate, uh, histograms very fast. Uh, and to be very efficient, right? So we had to put six of these on each module and then tile them across the head. Uh, so the, the detector was a, a long engineering uh, endeavor that we, we really embarked on to, to build this module. Um, and so that's the kind of front side. And these six detectors match the six lenses that I had just shown you from the front housing. Sure. And now, those detectors are mounted on a circuit board, I guess. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm going to take that circuit board out so I can show you a little more detail about the detectors. And so we, we split the system into two boards, actually. So there's one more board left inside the housing we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this is the detector board. So six detectors on this side. And then we have a bunch of supporting circuitry uh, on the back side. So I'm sorry, I got to ask, what can you tell me about the, de the detectors themselves? Yeah, so um, other than that, other than they are um, custom designed by Kernel, we don't want to go into too much of the architecture of uh, what we've done here to enable all those features uh, we talked about. Uh, the reason being, it's, it's probably uh, one of our, our, our most uh, powerful pieces of IP we have, which is how we put this whole system together and enable uh, really efficient time domain systems to scale over the head. But they're, they're fo it's photon counting. Right? Yes, we're, we're, we're doing photon counting, uh, traditional TCSPC, uh, which is time correlated single photon counting. So we're measuring the time uh, of each photon that hits our detector. So uh, I showed you the, the front side of this where our six detectors are. On the back side, uh, we have a, a bit of supporting circuitry. So this is, uh, there's another microcontroller, actually a very small one in every module that uh, again is helping us gather data and control each of the detectors uh, so that we can operate them at optimal bias points. Um, and then we have a, a few uh, power conversion circuits uh, that are there to provide the necessary uh, power supplies to keep everything running. Uh, and then uh, in the very middle, you can see a tiny little board to board connector that meets the detector board to the laser board. So the two are electrically connected uh, in the module. So, so wait a second though. I mean, just if I remember properly, each detector, you've got 800 million photons per second, uh, which is pretty crazy. You've got six of them. Um, so that's like five, billion photons per second, as you said. And that's all being routed on that circuit board. Um, yes. Yes. 200, 200 times a second. Uh, and, and so we, we spent a lot oh, so of- but that's 5 billion photons per second, all right. So, so, yeah, all right. But, but, but that's in that small little circuit board. Yes, this small little circuit board captures 5 billion photons per second. Uh, and uh, we compress the data down so that we can send it off across the helmet uh, back to the, uh, the hub where we, we uh, aggregate everything and send it over the USB-C. And wow, well, the, the temporal resolution, I mean, so for, 
and your 20 megahertz laser pulse. So for every laser pulse, each detector is getting multiple photons and you're getting the arrival times of, of all of them with what sort of temporal resolution? Uh, so I won't give away the exact temporal resolution we use, um, yeah. but it's less than 100 picoseconds. Uh, oh, yeah. And yeah. so we tag every single photon that comes in uh, with the time we detect it within 100 picoseconds. So that's one ten billionth of a second. Yeah, I mean, just there's, I know of no other system that's capable of, you know, doing that, right? I mean, by like, you know, two orders of magnitude. So that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, well, obviously we made a lot of engineering trade-offs. There are some systems that, uh, you know, have single picosecond resolution, uh, but they can't count anywhere near as many photons as we can. Yeah. So uh, it's all about engineering at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And meeting the needs of the application, right? So you're able to relax some of that temporal resolution now to get the speeds, right? But like a phenomenal improvement of like, you know, from a million to, but I forgot what you said, 800 million That's per second. That's just crazy. Yeah. All right. Wow. So that's our detection system. Anything else you want to talk about on this or should I move on to our lasers? Show you some of what's inside that. Um, well, I, you know, I'm very curious about the architecture of the detectors, but I understand that that's your uh, uh, prized uh, IP. So uh, I won't press more about that. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can talk some other time about that. Right. <laughs> um, so last, last critical piece of this is our laser board. Um, so what you can see here are there two lasers. Um, what we have here in the center is, uh, I don't see. Oh, can you see it now, uh, is a prism. Uh, and then uh, right next to it is where uh, the laser sits. So what we do is we, we have a, two, I guess, yes, right. two lasers. Um, and so we have a standard or a pair of standard edge emitting lasers that fire horizontally into the prism. Uh, and then this prism uh, is triangular. And so the light hits the prism and bounces vertically away from the board and into our light pipe. So wow. if I... Kind of, and you must have a collimator as well as the prism. No, uh, so we mount the lasers close enough to the prism so that we don't need a collimator. That's oh, hard to see here. Uh, so, uh, right, so we just manage the fast axis divergence. Spring. Sorry? The spring. Yeah, the spring is here on the... Here I, on the is there a lens? I forget. There were lenses on the detectors. Are there lenses on the source? I no, no lenses on the source side. So what we have is... Uh, oh, that's uh, why the source is a three millimeter diameter fiber. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons why. So when the, the light comes off the edge of the laser, it has a fast axis divergence. So it starts to spread apart with some angle. And so what we do is we move the edge of the laser very close to the prism. Um, and that allows us to capture the light before it spreads out too much. And then the prism shoots it into the, uh, the source light pipe. Being three millimeters, that means it can capture most of that angle again before it uh, uh, diverges too much. Yeah. The other reason to have three millimeters is it allows us to have a higher maximum um, output power uh, at the head. So it gives us a little bit of wiggle room for the safety limits, which yeah. uh, we talked before. Uh, we're well within those safety limits. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so um, it's a pretty simple design and you can see a lot of circuitry on here. Um, only a small portion of that is actually used for uh, driving the laser. Uh, there are more power supplies for the detector board on here as well. So we just kind of partitioned the module up so that we could pack everything in. And you can see there are even some circuits we don't even use. We don't even populate. Uh, some of the footprints. Yeah. So, it like a sparse board. <laughs> so um, yeah, we, we have room to grow. So there's more stuff we could uh, we could squeeze in here if we wanted to, but uh, we've we sort of met everything we were after and didn't feel the need to, to just fill up space. So I'm just thinking about the duty cycle of the laser. So it's 20 megahertz. You know, it's, it's probably, you know, just tens or tens, many tens of picoseconds pulse width. Um, those are, you know, the average power is low, but the peak powers you're hitting are pretty high. Um, so it, it's, uh, 
again, seems like very impressive engineering effort to get those powers out of that small package. Yeah, and in fact, one of the, the biggest challenges is uh, getting enough current to the laser in that very short uh, period of time. Uh, but uh, we went through all these iterations uh, of designing the, the circuits, of working on the, um, uh, the specific layout so we could optimize it and make sure we really get the performance out of the laser that we needed. Yeah, I mean, so the, what was the average power that you're getting? So in the, the red wavelength, which is 690 in our system, uh, we use about two milliwatts of average power. Uh, in the infrared wavelength, uh, which is 850 in our system, we use about four milliwatts of average power. Perfect. All right. So, you know, just the, the, um, the safety limits, you know, would allow, you know, a factor of five ish more than what you have. Um, and those safety limits, of course, are, you know, a factor of 10 lower than uh, any issues you would have with um, mild uh, heating of the skin. But, uh, you know, th this is way less, I mean, sorry, this is comparable to what's being used um, routinely, you know, in the FNIRS field, um, you know, for 30 years now. Uh, yeah, uh, they, they even use these sorts of power levels on babies, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, and we we've we've run many studies with those power levels, um, and just no no issue. Um, I mean, the, these these powers are actually less than the power you have in your red laser pointer um, that you play with your cat with. Um, so you know, it's safe for cats. Uh, uh, you know, safe for humans. So, David, in the days of Zoom, is that all you use your red laser pointer for now? Is playing with cats. I mean, I mean, <laughs> what else do you do with a red laser pointer? I mean, if, if you know, you use your your cool green or blue ones for um, presentations. Oh, okay, okay, obviously. Um, great. Yeah, I, I mean, we um, we you're right on the the calculations of what our maximum permissible power is. So, 28 milliwatts is about the max for our. Uh, beam size, so the three millimeter uh, light pipe, uh, and so we're, you know, one seventh of what's allowed. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And but it's also important just to you know remember that those safety limits are already built in a large safety margin, right? So you know you're one seventh below the nominal you know very safe margin, um, and it's also you know important to compare it with just walking outside on a sunny day. Right, where you'll actually get exposed to much more uh, power uh, on your scalp than you're getting from these lasers. Um, so it's, it's, it is very safe. Cool. Do you have any other questions or thoughts or responses to, to everything you've seen here? So that's, that's all, those are all my tricks. I don't have any more tricks to show you. Uh, but you must have at least three or four states, right? So that, you know, each, each module's laser is firing by itself, right? Or some sub subset of modules are firing at the same time and then it's temporally multiplexed between modules. Yeah, it's, it's, that's correct. So we're incredibly flexible. Uh, we actually designed in 512 states just for a nice round number. Uh, so, uh, you know, most people would probably only use, you know, maybe six or eight. Um, but if you wanted to, to do some really exploratory things, uh, you, you yeah. could you have five. well if you can just calculate on the fly so t if you're firing the laser at 20 megahertz and that's 50 nanoseconds and you probably want to wait i'll make it simple you know two and a half nanoseconds between laser pulses i mean that would allow you to have 20 states without having you know appreciable crosstalk between states so that 512 is overboard <laughs> Uh, it cost us almost nothing. So we, uh, you know, when, when anticipating the needs of uh, a community who's never had a device like this to play with, we were like, yeah, it doesn't really cost anything. So let's just, let's go overboard on this one. But uh, everywhere else, you know, we always weigh like, what's the cost of this and what's the, the potential use and how, how valuable will it be to, to the community that's using it. Can, um... I, I want to see you wear the helmet. <laughs> so I, I have to sadly report that I broke this helmet. Um, so <laughs> it is not mechanically sound to be picked up. 
Uh, however, we will have a replacement ready uh, by the time we have our live stream. So you'll you'll see the the helmet worn there. So you know, we'll probably cut this out. I have some uh, duct tape holding it together here. Uh, <laughs> so maybe so. <laughs> but, but, but what I'm all right. Well then, I can. I, what is not obvious to me at the moment is um, the what is is that everything? I mean, are the are the wires there? What what is it tethered to some power supply? So this is not everything. This is just the modules in the helmet. Uh, so there are some mounting points for the boards up top, uh, and then the wires that go to each module. So I showed you before, kind of. Uh, the wired heat sink uh, looks like this. So this is a pro uh, prototype version. Uh, this is not what we would send to a, a customer. Uh, so we're in the process of developing uh, embedded wiring into the, the headgear itself. So everything is connected by flex uh, within the, the structure of the helmet. Uh, so you won't have exposed wires. Uh, and then the boards uh, we're working on uh, reducing the size and uh, integrating better from our prototype versions. So we're we're still you know going through a process of uh, bringing certain aspects of the system up, uh, and uh, and it's not ready for prime time in that form. Uh, <laughs> but we have a few months until we start to ship these systems out. So. We're, yeah. we're comfortable w with the amount of work we have to do in sort of you know, taking wired things like this and integrating them into nice clean flexes that uh, uh, will look pretty all the time. It will look very slick. Yeah. It all sounds pretty impressive. Well, the cable, so is this just power? This just is, you said it's a USB to the computer and that's the data stream, but that, one USB is not powering this whole unit. It is. No. no. I mean, what, yeah. what's the current? What, so what's the current? That's five volts and how much current? So um, USB-C has a, a power delivery standard called USB-PD, uh, and it supports up to 100 watts of power delivery over a USB-C cable. OK, OK. And we're, we're comfortably below that upper limit. Yeah, 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 got it. So got it. we okay. won't we won't plug this in uh, directly to a computer. We'll have a hub that sits between it, a powered hub, uh, because yeah. most computers don't put out 100 watts over their USB ports. Um, but it's uh, it's part of the standard. And you know, if you think of a standard MacBook, uh, they have uh, they usually ship with an 85 watt uh, USB uh, PD charger. So um, we're we're kind of in the same range as a as a laptop computer in terms of power consumption. You know, I just hadn't thought about it before, but that's a lot of current on that cable. Wow. It, it's, it's funny, actually. So it works by negotiating up the voltage. So uh, USB PD has an active communication link between it. So you start at 5 volts and 2 amps, I think, by default. Uh, and then it talks on both ends. And if both ends support higher voltages, it goes up. So you can go up to 20 volts, 5 amps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All over your yeah. USB cable. Who knew? Crazy. Now I know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at the same time, you can get gigabits of data through that same cable. It's quite an engineering uh, feat in its own. It's, yeah, that's, it's a beautiful cable. And uh, obviously, we're announcing that we're doing this Flow 50 partnerships starting next year. So the goal is to have all the systems uh, brought up, validated, uh, done some neuro experiments with it, and uh, show that what we have is uh, is worthy of your time, so that you guys can can do interesting things with it. Yeah. So I guess yeah, I have to read the details about that. I guess I should talk to Catherine and see what uh, what, what you guys are looking for. Um, yeah, we'll we'll announce all the details next week. Uh, so got it. yeah, everything's coming out. All right. Super. Super. Yes, David, thank you for taking the time uh, to do this with us. It's really nice to have someone who's seen so many systems over the years uh, just take a look at what we've been doing and give first impressions. Uh, so we're, we're really happy to have you and uh, uh, be, be talking with you today. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, thank you for taking the time to show me all of that. Uh, definitely very impressive uh, engineering there. Um, it looks to me like you've done all the right things that you know, our community has talked about over the years, 
I'm, you know, really looking forward to seeing it in action. Um, All right. We'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, David. Take care. Have a nice weekend.